Jill Ochura. Welcome to the Mind Over Melody podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Good to have you on. And Joe is the founder of Go Brewing. That's how I know him, how I met him. And he also has the Not Almost There podcast. I haven't had one in a minute, but yes, I still do. It's still online. About 60 episodes or a little more than that. Yeah. And also there are like a lot of really great famous guests on that show. So I've actually heard of a lot of them. And yeah, so if you listen to a lot of podcasts, go check that out. If you need some inspiration, that's a great source of it. So the Not Almost There podcast. Am I correct in saying that? You are correct. It's on Spotify, iTunes. You could find it anywhere. Sweet. So links in description. And also I'm going to link Go Brewing's website so you can check out this delicious beer. So let's get right into it, man. Well, first off, is there anything you'd like to say to the people? We just ended dry January, and Mm -hmm. I know that that was like an event for you. The whole month was incredible for us. And I'd consider, you know, Super Bowl happens in in an evening, but for dry January purposes, we consider the whole month our Super Bowl. And it was a challenge very similar to dry January that got me into creating Go Brewing, where I abstained for alcohol for the first time in a very long time in my life. So I did this challenge for 75 days. And until I abstained, I felt like I felt like drinking was just normal, like being under the cloud of alcohol. I would drink multiple times a week at dinner, at the movies with my kids, like, I'd, well, you know, movie theaters just started having bars and I'd find one and find one with a bar, have a drink, the kids movie theater, nothing like where I'd wake up and be like, oh my God, I'm just craving a drink. But by five o'clock after work or on weekends, I would definitely have these massive cravings. And it wasn't until this challenge that I realized that by not drinking, I had less anxiety. I felt great. I lost weight. And I just wanted more of that feeling, but I had this, these, those cravings that I just spoke of. And the only thing that really curbed my craving was NA beer. It just played this, this uh, kind of effect in my mind that I didn't know the difference. And I was never like in search of the being drunk or like alcohol. Like certainly sometimes that would be a, a positive effect of drinking, but it wasn't like my my thing, what I realized is I was just in this habit. (laughs) I just had this habitual Friday feeling or weekend, you know, thing come over me often because it was decades of doing the same thing because that's what was normal. So really quick. So about how, before you hit a point where you took up this challenge, how many days a week were you drinking? I would say it would fluctuate, right? With some weeks, it'd be a few days. Some weeks, it'd be five to six days. And then like how many drinks would you have in a night? That also depends. Depended. I would say at least two, but upwards of like six or seven. So and like on the weekends usually? It really depended. Okay. So like I would, like if my wife and I decided to open a bottle of wine on a Tuesday, for whatever reason, you know, we I never left a unopened bottle of wine. We would finish that bottle, and then I would be feeling good, so I'd want another bottle, so then I'd open that bottle, so then that one innocent drink turned into two, because I finished the bottle of wine, turned into making a poor decision to having another bottle. Once it got past there, very rarely did we open a third. It happened, and, you know, we'd pay the price the next day. I'd wake up, and I would say things like, I'm not drinking tonight, and then guess what? By five o'clock, I'd have those cravings again. And it was this habitual cycle that even though I felt like shit in the morning and I knew I shouldn't do it, I I was more of like the binge drinker. Like it was hard for me to stop in the mornings. I never really wanted to drink. Okay. I I can relate to that a bit. However, I wouldn't say I was a binge drinker. I could be, I could be, but I never really got drunk. And the thing is that I've always took such good care of myself that the next day I just thought that that was normal. And mm-hmm. I didn't think it was affecting me at all. And so I, another reason I really wanted to have you on the podcast today, and uh, I don't do podcasts all the time either. I just have them because honestly, they're, they're awesome to talk to people. And you might not know, but you're like my counselor today. You're, <laughs> you're my unofficial counselor. 
because I'm approaching a full year of not drinking Congrats. alcohol. Congrats, Thank man. You. Thank you. So February 26th. I remember talking to you. Yeah. And you were actually the, the first person to ever challenge me for any sort of thing like that. And I wasn't really willing to do it fully. I was like, I'll do it partially, but I'm not going to do it on this vacation. Going to Florida, I remember. And I remember the anxiety that I had around gigs. And honestly, I still was having like a light beer or two on like the weekends. And I just wasn't playing a lot of shows and I wasn't drinking during the week. So by the end of it, it was it was interesting because I was going to the ice plunges that you were having during dry January, which I think a huge thing is like having an event around it. So like the fact there are like yoga classes you could go to or there was some sort of like exercise or entertainment in a community of people, not all of them, but like some people deciding to also take the challenge. And by the end of it, I actually was like, just really disappointed in myself that I didn't do it. And it, I still couldn't bring myself to drinking during the week because I was like, something inside of me just didn't want to let that go. Mm -hmm. And by the end of February, I had one beer at the Saturday show that I played. And then I had a 2.5% beer, which y'all were making mm -hmm. at a private gig that I played. And I realized after that, that the 2.5% didn't do anything for me. I'm like, you know what? This week, I'm not going to have any alcohol at all at my shows. So I made it through the first two shows and it was brutal. It was like a slow night, both of the nights. And I was like, is it me? Am I like not doing as good or something? Is my energy not right? Like I just felt so self-conscious. And then by the third show, it was at a brewery. I had Black Horizon Brewing, and I didn't have one. And, you know, it's like I also get free drinks at all these places mm -hmm. that I play. So it's like I'm turning down, like, a bunch of free drinks everywhere I play. A lot of people who, you know, mostly everybody would be like, oh, man, you know, I would totally be hooking myself up with this, that. It's like that's what I've done for 12 years. And by that third gig, though, I did a great job, and it was a great crowd. And I felt so good about myself because I knew that it was like 100% me that did it. And then another week goes by. Another week goes by. I cruise past the month and I just am like, I really like this. I have a lot that I want to like do in life. And like I'm noticing that I, I feel so great every day. And now it's like my new normal. So I don't really remember what it would feel like in contrast. Mm -hmm. But I think towards the end of that February, when I stopped drinking, I would notice what two Miller lights would do to me the, the next day. It's like just that's like 6% alcohol total or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, yeah, man. So I do want to say that you inspired me to do that. So well, thanks. But you're the one that did the work. And, you know, yeah. I inspiration can light a spark, but you really need that self-sustaining motivation to, to keep going. Yeah. But the strange thing is there really is nobody. There's like, there are not a lot of people like YouTube algorithms. Once you search mm -hmm. for, you know, dry January, once you search for like, how does alcohol affect you? Then yeah. YouTube will send you everything and all the Instagram. Stuff. Yep. Uh, but I wasn't getting any of that. Well, that's, that's what's funny about the algorithms. So the people that state, and my wife's one of them, that, man, there's just so much negativity on social media. Well, that's because it's self-perpetuating. It's because you're, it, the algorithm's smart. It's not, it's not the algorithm. It is what you are interested in, how much time you spend on articles. It's going to feed you more of that because the social media platform's job is very simple to keep you there. It's not going to send you articles that aren't relevant. So if you're drawn to negative stuff, you're going to get negative stuff and it self-perpetuates. The same thing happened to me. All of a sudden, you know, I was never like a guy that was just like, I'm going to be sober or everyone should be sober. In fact, I'm not even sober today. Like, But my feeds are filled with the sobriety movements, people that have quit drinking and tr transformed their life 
positive health and fitness stuff. And it's, and I get fed products in that realm too. So it's a really good discovery network. So my experience is very positive when it comes to those networks Me too. versus negative, but it was negative, right? Right mm -hmm. to your point. So, so I would, I mean, as a tip to anyone listening to this, if you're feeling like it's negative, it's, it's what you're engaging in. Like it knows that you've watched like the whole video of a comedian, or it knows that you've watched, or you engaged on an article and you spent a lot of time on it. And it's going to keep feeding you that. Yeah. So that was, that was the really crazy thing too. And I realized that first off, it felt like I stepped out of the matrix. Like that's how I describe mm -hmm. it. Cause I felt like every restaurant I walked into now, and it's not that it was like, I had like, it was like I was on doing this event that nobody else was doing. And so like, there's just a part or like people are always offering to buy me shots at gigs or parties and stuff. Like I went to a party. They're like, we got a bottle of Jack for you. We got the ginger ale ready to go. Like, I'm like, I, <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I mm -hmm. feel, I actually like really appreciate that. And I used to like, love that. I'd be like, hell yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And then you realize it just, it catches up to you. So you're, you're going to pay the price now or later for that stuff, you know, and it's, and it's not, again, this, I'm not a teetotaler. I'm not going to sit here and preach that no one should ever drink a sip of alcohol in their life. I do think there's, could be a place for it for some people. The, the issue is to your point, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story that I heard actually on a podcast. What one? This was on Rich Roll. Dude, I just watched one of those the other day and you also had Rich on your podcast. I did. So yeah. So, so this is, this is a funny story. This, this, guy created one year no beard it's not the one that was just on there was a podcast in january of one of the co-founders of, of that company this was an older podcast but the one year no beer is this sobriety kind of website movement to challenge you to just quit drinking this is what it was this was like five or six years ago and these it was developed by these U uk two guys from the uh, uk that were traders very wealthy but found the same thing you and i did that like we're in the matrix, everyone's drinking, this is life, and there's just something more. So they stopped, they actually quit their jobs, they were making a ton of money, and created this company to help others quit drinking. So that's that's what the whole company is. So it, fast forward a year later, they're having a party at their house to celebrate their one year anniversary of one year no beer, and their family comes over. What is their family bringing them as a gift? <laughs> Beer. <laughs> Alcohol, wine, sure, everything, yeah. right? So it's so ingrained in our society that it's no one's fault. It's just like for the past 100 plus years, if not beyond that, you know, we, we just look at alcohol as a way to celebrate. And, it, and now because of education and because we know what the harmful effects, much like we found out about cigarettes, people are taking you know, another look at it because we're so obsessed with eating the right things and eating organic and exercising and doing all this stuff, yet we're going to put ethanol in our body before we go to bed at night and not sleep, which is like the best thing that, that, that you can do for your body. It's better than any super drug imaginable is sleeping and it completely disrupts your sleep and it completely takes you away from your goals. And if you do that repetitively over time, your your heart will start having issues because now your resting heart rate's elevated at night. And it's just this compounding effect that happens to you. And it's just normal. Like we're just all used to it and it's fun. And it's like, let's go do a shot. Like, yeah, that's cool. But remember tomorrow, like that's, that's why we have that big slogan in our brewery, remember tomorrow because giant neon light, love the it. giant neon light, and we have a trademark actually on that. Heck yeah, dude! Because it is about this balance of being in the moment, the present moment, like you and I talking here. I want to be here right now, but I also want to, in the back of my mind, thinking, "Am I doing anything now to compromise tomorrow?" Yeah, and and that's where, if you think about that before you drink, even if you just take a mindful approach, you can change everything. Just a mindful approach. And I, when I say mindful, I'm careful because it, it can kind of sound like yoga babble a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But mindful is just thinking about tomorrow. Like, do I really need to drink at the theater with my, with my kids while we're watching a movie? I used to like get back from a work trip and I would be waiting for my ride at the airport. 
to go home. So now I'm like, you know, I was traveling at the airport and I would stop at the bar on my way out from the airport to have some drinks before I got in the car to go home. Like it was like that type of thing. And now I'm like, do I want to do that? Do I want to have that drink on the plane? You know, do I want it? And you, as soon as you start thinking about stuff and then you, you can replace it. Like that's a big thing with non-alcoholic beer or tea or now the luxury we have today is like you go down the aisle at these stores and there's a whole non-alcoholic aisle. So you can experiment with another category. And once you start having a few wins in the morning, you're like, I'm not hungover. Like it's, it starts to feel good. And you're like, I want more of that. Yeah. I'm also taken like, uh, I've just been like looking into other things that make my body feel good. Like I, and that resonates with me though. I'm taking so much money in supplements. I'm spending so much money in supplements and taking care of my body. And yet the most valuable thing I could do was just not drink towards my health and feeling and better. Yeah. Uh, and I was always good at sleep, but I notice now that like, see, I'd wake up after a Saturday of playing a gig and I'd be drinking at the gig. The next day I'd have like a brunch gig, but mm-hmm. that'd be super early for me. Cause I got to get there. I got to set up and like, I'm already tired. I got to warm up though before. So my voice sounds good. And I would need a drink right when I got there in order to like feel normal. And by the end of that gig, I'm like a zombie. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, by the end of it, it's like, I might go home and take a power nap. Maybe like I could maybe use one, but like, I'm pretty good. Like even on like six hours of sleep. Yeah. So pretty much I've been trying ginkgo. I've been trying ginseng, uh, astragalus. I got over there. Uh, Guarana, like there's all these other things. There's Alpha Brain, you know, mm-hmm. by on it. There's all these things that can actually make you feel good. Like I love chocolate. Mm-hmm. It's a natural euphoric. I love coffee. I've been splicing my coffee though with some super mushrooms, a little bit of cacao in there, you know, a little little bit of like maca, some to stretch it out so it's not all caffeine mm-hmm. and the coffee flavor goes on a little bit more. But yeah, man, I've been a fan of what other things can make me feel but will like make me feel better. We just came out with a beer. I don't know if you saw it. It sold out in two weeks. So we're bringing it back. It's called Freedom Amber and it was with L-theanine and ashwagandha. I'm glad you brought that up because L-theanine was something I leaned on heavily when I stopped drinking because I would go to the gig and I was looking up what can help because part of the reason I needed to drink at gigs was because it was a beta blocker. Mm Mm-hmm. And I looked up what are natural beta blockers and L-theanine mm-hmm. is. And ashwagandha, I know is at least a stress releaser, reliever. And I know it's, now I know it's actually a strand of ginseng. Mm-hmm. And it's on the other spectrum of ginseng to which it's not is it doesn't like raise your blood pressure as much. It doesn't give you as much energy, but it actually promotes like focus mm-hmm. and like immunity. So the fact you put those two things in there. It, it took us a while to figure out like what two things are we going to put in there because we could have done anything and there's a lot of options but we wanted to start with those dude that's badass and then you i mean you know no credit needed because like y'all have already thought of this but you could be like you know an amber what else do you call it it's freedom amber so it's gluten-free too you could that's say the thing with it. freedom amber plus and then maybe that's got a little caffeine in it too or a little b12 and caffeine so yeah. you got the one that's just going to make you feel good and make you feel chill and then you got the one that's like it'll give you those but also give you a little yep something like that yeah that's that's the kind of the freedom line is we're going to add a bunch of things like that to it i love it dude that is so that's so genius because it's that it's like then you're drinking beer and you are still feeling something mm-hmm but you're feeling good. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get a functional effect and no hangover. Yeah, okay. So this brings me to another question. And by the way, if there's something you really want to talk about in particular on the podcast, let me know because I feel like I can just go asking you questions right now. Like go just, for it. Yeah. So now that so – what was the biggest catalyst to making you do the challenge? Was it just somebody asked you? No, it was my wife and I looking at each other and feeling like shit for a very long time. And we always would say like, the diet starts Monday. And then that that was basically a code for like, 
we can eat whatever we want right now. We could drink whatever we want right now because the diet starts Monday. And that's how we lived for many years. And I had a lot of success building some businesses and, and selling those and from the financial side, achieving my dreams. And after I did that, I, I struggled a lot with my identity and kind of my why in life. And again, not to sound like yoga babble E, but like th it was an important thing because I had thought when I achieved the success that I did, I would just be happy and I would feel fulfilled. And I didn't at all. And I was like, what's going on? So I started drinking a little bit more actually. So this is post 2018. Well, 2020 hits, obviously we know that's COVID, which was like the best excuse to like double down on bad habits. And at the time, I mean, if you recall and everyone else, like, we, like no one knew what to think. Like we're like, Oh, on one end, you're kind of scared. You're like, what's going on? And, then, and another end, you're like, yeah, I get to spend time with family and chill. And then that lasts about a week until you're like, okay, this is, this is crazy. Like, yeah. so then you start to, to drink more. And then my wife and I heard about this challenge called 75 hard. And we're like, we, we need to do something big, like something where we're going to commit to it. We're going to make ourselves accountable. And I give her a ton of credit because I've, I've seen a lot of people try this and they fail. And it's usually because their partner isn't in it with them. And my wife was like a hundred percent in. So what we did is we looked at Thanksgiving and we we're like, well, we definitely want to have wine at Thanksgiving. So let's back 75 days from Thanksgiving. And that's when we started it. So this was like midsummer ish, right? Or like late summer. And we started this challenge and the, it consists of a bunch of things, but the couple hardest things for people are working out twice a day. One time has to be outside, one time's inside. Oh, that's part of the challenge. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's part of the challenge. So there's like 10 things. Uh, but and another thing, you, if I'm not mistaken, you were like, I don't want to say, were you overweight? You yeah. Just, okay. Oh, yeah. So no, I was overweight. You, what did you weigh? At that time, I was probably 240 pounds ish. And what do you know? I'm 190. That's pretty drastic. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it, it took a while. It's, it seems like in pictures, it was just overnight, but it, it wasn't. But the biggest thing with this challenge was like, I had to eliminate drinking and I hadn't went a week without drinking since I was probably 15, to be honest with you, Jeez. years old. So it's like, this was really new to me. And when I went a week without drinking, I started taking on positive habits. Like I started to eat better and then my, I started to work out. Well, I had to work out because this challenge and then all of a sudden less anxiety that you experience. I was more mentally clear. I started to lose weight. My, I didn't feel bloated. Like when I used to drink, I used to feel like, like just my gut would get big and I'd walk around and I'd suck it in, look in the mirror. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a shape, you know, but <laughs> the reality is I'd see pictures of myself and I was like, Oh my God. Over time, over that 75 days, it got easier and easier. And the first two weeks sucked. Week three was okay. Week four, I was I remember running downtown Naperville, ran by Jackson Pub, which is like one of my favorite spots. It's this Still burger. Got great food, though. Great food. It's a burger place for anyone who's listening that's not around here. It's a burger place, great draft beer. I'm running by. Everyone's in there having fun and... Like, oh, man. And, but then I would come home and I have an NA beer and my curving went away like that. Like it just went away. And I kept doing that and doing it and doing it. So 75 days passes, we feel great. Our skin looks good. Like my wife's looking sexy and like, I mean, she was sexy, but she's looking sexier. And like, can I ask you another yeah. thing about that? Cause yeah. you were in this with your wife. Mm -hmm. Did you notice like, cause everybody has, disagreements uh, nobody's perfect every couple's working through little things you might just have you know an angelic relationship all the time i don't know no but what i'm trying <laughs> to ask is did you notice a difference in when you were drinking to when you weren't drinking on how you would like work through stuff oh a hundred percent like uh, we would argue about well when two things happen one they were uh, it's always about someone else typically like a family member of mine, it would cause an argument. Like either there was just something 
going on. So that would be one argument. The other arg argument would be we're both intoxicated. Like, and someone says the wrong thing to one another and we just take it in the wrong way and it just blows up into something. And then you have these deep seated things about something that happened. And, you know, it's, it's like that shit, like a hundred percent. Like, so yeah, we really didn't fight those 75 days <laughs> because we were sober. And if there was something bothering us, we would talk through it. That's, that's amazing, dude. That's, yeah. That's really nice to hear. So then, yeah, that's that 75th day, though. We were like, let's celebrate with wine. And, and then we ended up going to Hugo's Frog Bar, 76th day. Was I there? <laughs> uh, you might have been there, actually. And then we ordered a bottle of wine. And then we barely could drink it. We were like, we didn't even, we just bottled it up. We just uh, corked it, I, sh I should say, and brought it home that night. And I mean, remember, I just said a few minutes ago, we would go through like three bottles a night sometimes, yeah. two to three bottles. And now I can't even finish one bottle at dinner and it was incredible. And from that point forward, my relationship with alcohol changed. That makes that, that brings up an immediate. Another question is the rich roll podcast that I watched last. I don't remember the, the guy's name who was on it, but he was rich was like, I can't drink again because you know, I'm the 12 step guy. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm an alcoholic. I can't do it. And the other guys like, I do because essentially I think he wants to have a, an, a more open door as like somebody who can influence people because he isn't like demons don't grab him when he takes his first sip of alcohol. Mm -hmm. He can have a drink, but he identifies as someone who doesn't drink, who can have a drink once in a while, like not very often. And I'm, I'm wondering when I come to February 26th, I've had a lot of fun, like times in between, <laughs> you know, I've gone through all the holidays. I know I can have a drink, but I'm trying to figure out for myself. Does this mean that every time I'm out to dinner, I'm on a date, I can have it. Does it mean only if it's like a special occasion? I can, cause like, I like how I feel so much without it that like giving myself the option to have it, it isn't going to make me drink more. I wasn't an alcoholic. I never even got drunk. Like mm -hmm. I was like a two, maybe three drink guy, but I would have like two drinks almost every day and they weren't ever heavy. If I had like a Manhattan or something, it'd be one, mm -hmm. maybe a light beer after. But yeah, man, I never identified as somebody who couldn't stop drinking. It was I needed to have something. So I can really relate to this because I went on a four to five month streak probably about six months ago and I hadn't had a sip of, of anything and I felt great, very similar to you. But what happened is I started building up this anxiety the other way because yeah. I was like, my God, my streak is so high that now I don't want to break it. And now I am having anxiety about what happens if I break it? How am I going to feel? And this is where the mindfulness and thinking ahead really helped. And I'll tell you what happened to me. So I would avoid all of the drinking around here, going out to dinner with the family. I'm in Canada doing a speaking engagement with my wife. We are in Banff, which is a beautiful part of uh, Western Canada. We were at this fondue restaurant, which fondue is like one of my favorite foods. It's great. And there's, it's a very intimate setting and there's this wine pairing that's put in front of us. Like, and I thought about it and I said, how am I going to feel tomorrow? And actually at that moment, I said, you know what? Tomorrow, I think I might regret not doing this because I want to enjoy this moment with my wife. Certainly we, she didn't pressure me, but it was this experience that we could talk about the taste and the culinary pairing of wine and what we were going to enjoy together versus not doing it. And so I broke my streak that night. Yeah. And that's, that's the way sometimes when I'm out to like, like for instance, one thing that I would, that I missed a lot. is like, anytime I go get sushi, I loved having some hot sake with the sushi. Mm -hmm. I, like I wouldn't even have more than one. Like, but it just really hit the spot with the sushi. And sometimes like that sort of pairing stuff 
that that's a nice experience. It's it's because yep. it's bringing in more than it's bringing it's, in more than just the alcohol. It's like yeah, it's a, it's accentuating the experience yeah. that you're having, right? It's taken up up an, a notch. But then the next day, I woke up and I had no regret. I was like, I don't feel bad about what I did. I felt kind of relieved because I built up this streak, and I did have one experience. So from then, it it brought back that craving of wanting alcohol that night. Mm. And I was like, shit. So, so there's the positive side, but then there's the negative side that once you stop drinking for a while, those cravings become less and less and less, but they never fully go away. They, they go from like, if you think about volume of like zero to a hundred, they'll, they'll go from a hundred to 99 to 98, but they'll never get like under 10, like volume okay. 10. They're always like hovering at seven or eight. They're always there. Yeah. And then as soon as you have it, it's like, oh yeah, hey, I'm back. I, th I thought you forgot about me. And now all of a sudden this craving bounces back. And then that's when NA beer comes right back to the rescue. And I'm like, man, so like a few weeks ago I had, I had a couple of drinks. I was out mindful. And to put in perspective, I would drink well over 16 drinks a week before. And now I'm, I'm not even close to that in a month. Like, so one fourth, one fifth, if that, and, but I had two, two drinks. I get home and I'm like, man, I'm craving another one. It's like nine o'clock. I'm about to put Grace into bed. My son, I lay with him every night. I just went to the fridge and I grabbed a double NA or double IPA of our NA beer and just curb, curb my craving went away. So I, I use it as a tool and it really works. Okay. So do you, do you have any sort of limits like that you've, pre-thought of because this With, this brings me to another question of willpower something that i've heard about willpower which i kind of embellished on is that i feel that willpower is something that you actually don't have right like like at in an immediate moment i don't really think willpower is something people have i feel like willpower is something that it was previously thought of at least once to where if I'm going to experience this or even a feeling going into something, how I would handle it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't previously think about what you're going to do in a situation, how do you possibly <laughs> not just go with the thing you always do? Well, that's the problem with alcohol though. That goes, that goes out the window. But that's like why it, I'm asking yeah. you now, after your experience, you're here now, you've obviously got a healthy relationship with it. And, you're inspiring a lot of people, including myself. And so do you have a limit on it? Or is it like you don't mind having a night where you kind of binge out? I My plan is to change my environment. So I'll give you an example not related to alcohol. I love pizza. Okay. I would order pizza with the family. I would get like the largest pizza you can possibly get. And the family would eat not even half of it, and I eat the rest of it. Well, the only thing to stop me from that is to get a smaller pizza. Like, I would change the environment of the pizza, right? I know it sounds silly, but so now if I get a smaller medium and I eat half of it, that's okay because it's, it's a lot less than that fiesta size extra large one. And and I knew that was an issue like I would have. And it's and trust me, I don't, I'm not perfect by any means. Sometimes I splurge and I still get the the big pizza, but it's an exception, not the rule anymore. And that also gained, you know, that also compounds and that's how you gain weight and feel like shit too. So putting it back to alcohol though, so putting it back how to, do you do that? You, you limit to the, the amount of time that you're going to stay in an environment. So if I'm at a bar, I am going to be more prone to want to drink, especially after I have a drink. So I'm going to plan my visit at the bar to be, like, I'm, I'm just going to be in here for a half hour or an hour or plan it to where I have somewhere else to go. So if you see me and you see me leave, it's it's intentional. It's not you. It's me. Because yeah. <laughs> cause I need to get myself out of that environment. If I stay in the environment, it makes it the willpower a lot harder. My house isn't, isn't you know, filled with beer anymore. It's filled with N.A. beer. So I go home and I don't really have a lot to grab for. Certainly, I have a wine cabinet and 
and you know i could open a bottle of wine but there's a lot of friction there you know there's yeah. a lot there it's easy to open like a, a a can of beer the other thing i'll do is if i really want something i notice now my taste buds have changed where any beers feel so much lighter on me that if i have a hoppy beer from like cop butcher or something like that or one of these like big hazies i can't even drink more than like yeah a little bit of it anyway so i'll take two sips and i'll dump it and it, and it helped me there too okay yeah nice man those are yeah that's all good stuff it's and it's all really helpful because i know that it probably seems like to other people it's like if you're gonna go a year maybe like maybe that maybe you are done or something like that but it's like it, it wasn't that i think what happened is i got to three months and i had the guilt thing mm -hmm. and instead of remedying that i said you know what i'm pretty badass i'm gonna go for a year and that's what I did. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going for a year. It's going to be hard. I'm going to go through every single holiday, every single thing I can do. I'm going to go through at least once vacations, you know, fishing, all these things, Christmas. And I'm not going to have a drink. Mm -hmm. And then I'll feel like when I come back at it, I can say that I'm able to not have a drink at anything that I'm doing, weddings, whatever. So that was important for me, I think, to get through every single thing. So there wasn't one thing left on the table. It's like, I have to have a drink at that. And that was, that's another big thing too, is like, I kept telling myself that I need to be in control of this. Like I need to know my limit and be able to control myself. And if I can't do that, then I have a problem. And that, that's why going through things like dry January is a check within yourself to me that you can control this and it's not controlling you. Because when it controls you, it's scary because it's a substance that's designed to be habitually used. Yeah. And that is why it's the most used drug on the planet is because it gets in our system and you develop these cravings and you want it and it creates this escape. It creates this ability to push a button and now you're in another state of being and you're escaping your reality which could be a positive sometimes but the problem is when you continuously escape your reality it catches up to you and you're going to pay the price and that's what i started paying the price i also my father died in 2006 of alcoholism and he certainly did that he'd wake up every day and he would mask his problems under alcohol and drugs and what happened? He was 55 years old and he ended up dying from alcohol and drugs because it catches up to you. At 45, he was fine. He felt great. You know, he's the life of the party. 46, life of the party. Fast forward to 50, 51, shit starts catching up. His diabetes, he's getting sick. He's so hooked on it, he can't stop. Yeah. And it's a downward spiral. Once you start feeling worse too, then it's like you just need something to feel better probably. I heard this that's, quote. By the way. Yeah. Sorry to hear that, man. Oh, that's, well, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, you can take things like that in your life in two ways. You can look at them and you can learn from them or you can follow the same path. And I was like, okay, thank you, dad, for showing me that. And, and I know I am susceptible to the same things. Like he's a human that wasn't as educated with regards to this stuff. I happen to be because the internet is here and like you just learn and your, your feeds filled with information about it and you start to be inquisitive back then. It, I mean, it was just harder for people. Like everyone was, was doing it. I grew up in Calumet city in the South side of Chicago, the East side, the Southeast side. And I mean, that's just what we knew. That was the environment we were in. You know, you don't know better until you escape it. And then you start to see it from a different perspective. And I was going to say, I heard this quote a while ago from a guy named Jim Quick. I'm sure took it from someone else, like everything on the internet. But it's it it's really true. And if you think about it, it is m really meaningful. The harder you work now, the easier life becomes. The easier you take life now, the harder life becomes. And just think of it in general. Anyone that you know, put that saying on your experience with them or knowing about them. I haven't found that not to be true with anyone. 
if they've passed away from alcoholism, which I have friends in forties that have done that. If I have people and friends that are thriving. And the other thing I'd say is model the behavior that you want to become. So when I started to go down this path, I started to get really into like leadership and Navy SEAL type stuff. And I've had Jocko on the podcast, Chad Wright, ran with David Goggins. Like I was blessed to be around these amazing humans and many, many other successful people, way more successful than I am. And the one commonality... That's all arguable. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe... Correct. Maybe on yeah. maybe on paper. Um, current paper. Current future paper. paper never know. Exactly. And I'll say the common denominator with all of those people, then none of them drank. So, okay, do I want to be more like them? And I was never a guy to emulate anyone. Like, like I don't look at anyone with envy. I'm not one of those guys. And it's like, oh my god, I would love to meet X person. I just that never crossed my mind. What I like to do is talk to people and learn from them and, and, and just pick up nuggets of wisdom from them. I agree with that, by the way. Yeah. I just was, I was never like that. Like whenever, you, you know, something that I found out by just observing entertainers, performers, that same thing. I'm like, what is it that really draws some people to some people? And for mm -hmm. me, it's their ability to be free and love themselves that everybody wants for themselves. And mm -hmm. they think that by getting that person's time, they're going to get that feeling. But really what they're trying to get is what they f that person feels about themselves. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get like a little. And so by going for the nuggets, by going for the information, by like searching for interviews, you're going to actually get more of what you really want from that person. A hundred percent. You're right. I mean, the, the people I admire would be the most authentic, weird people, like the people that are going against norms. And then you pick up something from these, these folks. Like, for example, like, I know you'll like this. Like I went to an event called Running Man and it was like Burning Man, but for running. I know it sounds okay. kind of crazy. <laughs> and then there was this session that I went to and it was all about, it was all about sprouting. Right. And there's this guy and he was incredibly Dean Evans passionate about sprouting. And that was just like his life. Well, if I just brought him around my friends, he'd be like, man, this dude's weird. But if I want to learn about sprouting, that dude is a genius. Like, and, and <laughs> by now, sprouting, what do you mean? Like plants? making sprouts in, in your home, like oh. co making your own food. Nice. With, with seeds, with sprouts that turn into, yeah, broccoli sprouts and all these things that you could just make yourself and they're incredibly nutritious. So he was teaching a course how to do that. Huh. But like, like, again, I bring him around my friends. They're like, man, this, this guy, all he talks about is sprouts, but like, <laughs> but like the reality is like, that's super valuable. And those are the people yeah. I'm drawn to now is cause like, I want to learn about something that's different. If I, I wanted to learn about like mindset, I did this run with David Goggins, hope to learn. He didn't really talk much, but like, you know what I mean? Like you just try to like be around people that teach you a nugget or two instead of being like, I want to be him. Cause I don't like, I don't, I, I, I'm sure they have all have good lives, but like, I like my life and I just want to take these nuggets and you're not going to be able to do that under the cloud of alcohol, going back to alcoholism and drugs. Cause you're like, your mind isn't there. Like it can be. And, 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 and when I'm speak to this, it's like, I'm speaking from my perspective of like being under the clot of alcohol for so long and not even realizing it, the, yeah. the norm of, of what I was feeling, there was no baseline to enrich my life. And once I started to control that, I started to see all these things in a different way. Yeah. And you know what? I also think is just volume of quality clarity. Also, yeah. it's like, it's like the more time you can put into something too, because like you might have genius poking through because like you still end up feeling good some parts of the day. You still end up feeling good on your first drink or two, second drink, third drink. There's all these times where you're still going to feel good and you can still be a genius, but like you could have way more of that. Oh yeah. I was thinking about this yesterday on my, on my drive and I was like, why is go successful why did we build this company it's a and we just like launched a year ago and we're doing some amazing things because of the amazing support 
And to your point, much like you practice like crazy, I put in 120 hours a week at minimum. From the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, I'm working on this business. That's so much. But it's not. It's yeah. fun for me. So yeah. like I don't even I don't even consider it work. And that's the thing is like once you find your passion in something and you could start to build these blocks, it you you create this not a building, you're creating a city, which then creates a much bigger environment. And all of a sudden you you don't really know until you step out of it and you look and you're like, holy shit. And that's how I built the last business from zero to eight hundred employees one at a time. One day at a time, one hour at a time. And I was so proud of every single gig that I'm playing, thinking like, oh, I'm going to get going in here. And then you were already there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> like, so that happens so many times, dude. I'm like, well, thanks, wow, man. you guys no, I mean, are... it's your support. Uh, okay, so I suppose you've satisfied my need to kind of hear how to how to approach the one-year mark. Since that was my goal, that was my goal. Now I can look at it how I really want to look at it. I got through it. I took more than most people need. I'm so happy about hearing your perspective on that and how you've reapproached it. I feel like I relate 100% to that. So what I guess I'd like to ask now is what are the biggest windfalls you've had and what are the biggest challenges? You don't have to list a lot for Go Brewing. For Go Brewing. Yeah, what, um, what were the biggest windfalls that you feel like you came across? For sure, like executing our plan. Like there wasn't something that happened that was so out of the context of what I what we had planned to happen. We planned to launch on e-commerce first because that was my background and something I knew. I didn't know distribution and how to sell in stores or restaurants. I knew how to sell online. And I'm like, with any beer, you could sell it online. We could sell it online, build a brand presence. We executed that well. And the goal is to really understand the market and then figure out what beers are selling better than others, make more of those and sell them to bars and restaurants and stores and all that fun stuff. And that has happened. So executing the plan to me was really important to be building a team of now 15 people that weren't otherwise even thinking about working for a non-alcoholic brewery. Um, all of those were were things that I'm really proud of. Something that caught my eye was you, Billy, you worked on something with Billy Corgan for Lollapalooza. Just, yeah, it was just yeah. a drink, but like stuff, like was there anything like that that came about or did you find all of those things? You know, my... And was it people, a success? People think that like I'm lucky or like things happen and I'll say that I'm extremely prepared. Yeah. You know, you've heard that luck is when preparation meets opportunity, yep. right? And I will tell you that by putting in the work, I'm always ready for something. Yep. So when we had that opportunity with Billy Corgan and, and really it was his wife and their tea shop to make something for Lollapalooza, like we, we were ready to do it. Like we were, I didn't have to like go buy something new. Like we just happened to be ready for it. Yeah. So it, it was just like the right place, the right time. But, but I wouldn't, I would say in the scheme of things, that wasn't, a huge win for the business. That was cool. It was really exciting. It just caught my eye. Yeah, no, it was really cool. And, and that's another but, thing is like, I I know like a, the internet, that's the kind of stuff that catches their eye some, a lot of times. And, sure. and I agree with you 100% on like, yeah, like I feel really blessed to do what I've done for 12 years and every year has gotten better. Yep. And yeah, I do get lucky sometimes and things that I would have never expected to happen, happen. But at the same time, I was ready for them in so many interesting ways. And so it, your your level of business prow, prow, prowess is something that I'm still aspiring to. And so I wanted to have you on the podcast, one, because of that, two. And because I respect your time, I also wanted to make sure it was something like where we could be like, talking about dry January and maybe getting mm -hmm. people stoked because the next one you do sober October as well at Go Brewing, right? Yeah, but I would say think about February to October as a big opportunity. Like yeah. it doesn't need to be these these things that are artificially created, you know, that happen to rhyme and sound cool together. Like it's just about a lifestyle. And February is a great month to have a challenge because it's a short month. So like, so like that's a really good way to think about it too. Going back to your question though, challenges every day. Like today the something happened like you know we we get these tanks we try to 
put them in for a capacity we're all planning on and the tanks don't even fit through our door. Like shit happens every day, (laughs) every day. And it's, and it, you know, another thing I heard is like one third of the time you're feel emotionally. And, and I should say as an entrepreneur, it's an emotional roller coaster. I mean, the, the chance that you, you take is far beyond what others see. Like you don't go into this in anything, at least that I've been a part of with a salary or with compensation or with anything. Like you don't, it doesn't even cross your mind. Health insurance, savings, matching, zero, foreign, whatever. Zero. I, I, the last business I, it was three years before I took a salary in it. Like this, and you're risking a lot. So like this business, you know, you you enter it and now I'm competing against billion dollar companies with insane budgets that'll just kick you off of sponsorships because they can because they have more money to throw around and the reality is it's an emotional roller coaster and within five minutes i'll have three different feelings but what i've found is that's normal like and in life i think it's normal and this is the way i think about it one third of the time i feel like i'm a a genius i feel like i'm the smartest person in the world which is something that the fact you can admit it yeah is also the reason why you're successful because I feel like a huge problem is that a lot of people can't accept the fact that they are capable of being. One third of the time, I feel like I'm the biggest moron in the world. True. And one third of the time, I feel like I'm good. Like I'm right in the middle. And that is applicable to a lot of different things. I took that from Olympic athletes that are training. One third of the time, they're like, this is unbelievable. Beast. I'm going to crush this. One third of the time, they're like, this is horrible. I don't even know why I'm in the Olympics. And one third of the time, they're good. And the the thing you got to watch out for, if you over or under index in any one of those, you got to watch out. If you're feeling too good, shit's about to go down. If you're feeling too bad, just hold on because it's going to get better. And if you're coasting, maybe you should push a little harder because you really don't want to stay in that category for too long either. And some that happens is anytime I'm feeling good, like like I'm feeling like I'm crushing something, I am so afraid to say it out loud because mm-hmm. I feel like the second it leaves my mouth, I'm mm-hmm. like, you jinx yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's not even like I've only realized at one time. I don't know if it's my subconscious mind. I don't know if it's God. I don't know what it is, but certainly I agree with you that those things have to be balanced. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to have to bolt in a second because yeah, yeah. i got to go to my daughter's is, is there basketball any, game. Is there anything else you really would like to say before? I think you you covered a good spectrum of it. I mean, I, we could keep going in any yeah. direction. Well, Joe, I love you, man. I love you, dude. Thanks Thank, for having yeah. me here, man. It's, it's great. It means a lot that you came on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Let's do it again. Yeah, sounds I'm good. happy to double click into any of these topics. I could talk forever and then... Cool. Or about them, I should say. Well, hey, dude, I'm I'm excited to get back into being able to responsibly have a beverage and then having some NA beers from Go Brewing when I really get that craving. Yeah, and I hope I didn't encourage you in the wrong direction. It's just a matter of no, you, you know what we talked about. That was already what I was thinking, but that guilt's real. So it that's is. something you it don't is. even know you're going to come up against after this potentially is it might make you feel so good that you you almost feel like you're going to let yourself down. Yeah. So, so it's real hurdle. That's it's how the, crazy alcohol is, right? Yeah. Like how it plays all those tricks in your mind. But good luck and keep me posted. See you, brother.